So I'm currently um, a senior lecturer in, in theatre, film and television. Um, I became senior lecturer about a year ago. I'm on research leave this term, which is lovely. I'm very fortunate because about eight weeks, well, exactly eight weeks ago, I had a little baby boy. So I have a chronic uh, lack of sleep and a chronic overload of joy, and those two things make a heady mix. <laughs> so, um, so first of all, I did my, P uh, my PhD here at York. <clears throat> I did my master's here as well. Um, and I was very, very lucky. I did my PhD finished in 2010. So I started it um, 10 years ago. I was quite pleased got it done in, in, the, in the three years, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, and I was so lucky because they built that campus over there just as I was finishing, and they needed uh, a lecturer in theatre, and I applied for, for that post. So I was very lucky, and I know that, that in some ways is, um, is atypical because lots of people don't have those opportunities to open up at the minute they finish their PhD, and I knew that that was coming up. So the last year of my PhD felt like a year-long job interview, so I tried to do everything I possibly could <laughs> to position myself in, in the right way for, for that job um, coming up. Um, during my PhD, I published, oh, right at the end of the PhD, I published one article. I think actually it was in press by the time I'd finished. So when I, went, when I applied for jobs, and I applied for other jobs, which I'll talk about, um, I had an article that was coming out. And then um, soon after my, my PhD, I did a, a book, a kind of book of interviews. My research is looking at um, acting processes. So how actors approach different roles. So my PhD was on documentary theatre, and I've just started looking at um, television acting as well. So that's kind of my area. So I interviewed lots of interesting actors, and I wrote about them in my PhD. But um, I edited a book of interviews with about 16 actors, and that came out just after my um, PhD was um, finished. So again, I had that kind of in press when I was applying. I then had a bit of a gap where I was like, I only know about one thing, and I've kind of done that in my PhD. So I kind of tried to write that into a monograph, which came out in 2013. And then I had a longer gap where I was like, now I know absolutely nothing. I spent three years just thinking about this one thing. I've done the book on it, and I know nothing. Um, and it's taken me three years to realize I know a little bit, or to research a little bit, about acting on telly. And I've got two books coming out, one's out last week, and one's out in um, January about that. One's edited, and one's a kind of co-written monograph sort of thing. So it's kind of written with a colleague, but is an analytical piece. So that's kind of me. That's the bit that I'm like, yay, that's really pleasing, and I'm really lucky to be where I am, and that's what I've been publishing. Um, but it's probably not very interesting. So the bit that's more interesting, hopefully, is, first of all, the experiences of doing my, um, my PhD. So I was um, unfunded for my first year of my PhD. It was quite galling, I'll be honest. We, um, the three of us do masters together um, in the department of theatre, film and television who wanted to apply for a PhD and um, I applied to the AHRC um, first and my two very good friends, still, still good friends despite what I'm about to say, were like, um, is it okay if we read your application? I said, like, absolutely, there you go, I read it. They got full funding from the AHRC, I got absolutely nothing and, and I was gutted for the first year. So I um, lived with my parents who live on the outskirts of York, um, I waited a uh, uh, all evenings to afford to do the PhD. Um, but actually, looking back, and I know we can kind of make any rough bit feel like it was important in some way, but I think that was quite important because the year after I got what's called the teaching studentship, and I don't know if they still exist in the same way. I got my fees paid and I got five grand a year, and in return I did shed loads of teaching. That was the deal. So I didn't have enough money to not to live with my parents and to pay them a sort of under the market value of rent to still live there. Um, but it meant I could carry on doing a PhD. So it, that, was the, um, uh, that was the situation in my second and third year. And I had to do 50 hours teaching a, um, a, a year to, as part of that studentship. And I think that's probably what got me the job in the end, was because I did lots of teaching. So, so out of something that was pretty frustrating at the time, probably worked out quite nicely for me. So I just want to say a bit about my experiences of, uh, of, of actually doing a PhD. Um, because I think, from talking to other people, they've shared some of these feelings, and it might be useful. I think a few of you might be finishing your PhD, but some of you are just starting. So if you're just starting, it's probably more relevant. I didn't think I could do a PhD until I'd done it, and at very, very few moments during the three years did I think I could do it. I never had that kind of like, do you know what? I'm actually quite good at this. Not wanted to have that. All I had was that if I sit in front of the computer for long enough, Words will keep coming out, and in the end, those words will be long enough to be a PhD. That is honestly, was my feeling. It's like, I'm just going to, I'm going to do this, and I'm damn well going to finish it. Um, 
I don't think I, my research for my PhD was unbelievably brilliant. I actually really don't think it was. But I was like, I'm going to do it, and it's got to be good enough to get me a PhD. That's what it had to be. So, how did I do that? Um, well, firstly, I had worked from nine till five pretty much every day, and then I sort of waited in, in evenings. I'm not saying that that is a good thing, but for me, I had to view it like it was a, a job. I really had to do that because I couldn't cope. My friends were brilliant. They're doing like, oh, well, I didn't do any work during the day and I just worked a bit this evening and tomorrow morning I'll do some work. I just couldn't do that. I had to know that between nine and five with an hour for my lunch, I was going to sit in front of the computer and try and write stuff. And I worked out, and I'm, I think my um, productivity has gone down, but I used to think if I do eight hours, probably four hours would be of some value. So a rest of it would be checking Facebook, checking Twitter, going on BBC News website, you know, going for a walk, those sorts of things. But I thought four hours a day when I'm working is actually quite a lot of work. So I thought that wasn't a bad, like, 50% concentration, and I do think it's gone down since then. Um, I worked out my pattern of writing. I think that's quite a useful thing to think about. My pattern would be that I would write best in the morning, but not write in the morning, no, not at the very beginning of the morning. So I, at nine, I'd probably do bits and bobs for an hour, and then I'd be best between 10 and 12, and then basically the charts would just go downhill from there onwards. So what I would do would be I would do new bits of writing in the afternoon, and I'm like, I think I've got an idea, I'm just going to write it, and I know it would be rubbish, and it felt rubbish when I was writing it, and very kind of quote heavy, and I didn't really know what I was saying about those quotes, but I'd write that in the afternoon, because I knew the next morning, between <laughs> the narrow hours of about 10 and, say, half 11, I would then be able to focus on that and make it better. And that was kind of the pattern I got into. So you'll have patterns that work for you, but it might be worth thinking about that. Because I knew that by 4 o'clock, between 4 and 5, I wouldn't do much that was very good. But I was kind of at peace with the fact that it wasn't going to be very good. So I found kind of finding a pattern was really, was really useful to me. I I can only write in blocks of time, I still can only do that. I can't write in 10 minute like, you know, oh, the student hasn't turned up, right, I've got 20 minutes, why don't I just write? I cannot do that. I can only write in blocks, and the, the, the smallest block that I can write in is normally about two or three hours. Otherwise, I just can't get going. So I tried to do, when I was teaching, I'd be like, okay, I'm teaching from one till four, so I will try and get a three hour block in the morning. If I was teaching in the morning, in the afternoon, that's pretty much a write off, so I'd just try and do a bit of reading or transcribe an interview that I'd done. So I'd try and adapt my work into when I knew I could be productive. Um, just to go back to the several moments when I thought I'd give up, my supervisor was, um, was, was brilliant and, and like formidable and, and sort of terrifying and all of those things. And I really think she, meant, she helped me do my, my best work, so I'm really sort of grateful to her. Um, but when I get an email from her that just says, Tom, I've read your work, let's meet, <laughs> it would just be so terrifying. Those emails are still like, etched on my soul. Um, so I was pretty scared about the whole thing. Um, and the worst I had was when uh, she, I met her for supervision and she said, how long did this take you? And I was like, about four weeks. And she kind of thought it was terrible and that I just sort of knocked it up in the morning. So it was kind of pretty hard work. Um, and that kind of brings me on to the question of loneliness. People say that doing a PhD is lonely. And I kind of, during the PhD, I thought I don't agree with that because I was kind of part of a bit of a, a group of us in the department. I kind of had enough mates and things to do. I didn't feel particularly lonely. But I think the thing that is lonely about doing a PhD is the kind of relationship between the, the graft and the effort that you put in for then somebody to kind of go, like you print it off and you get this thing that's like 20 pages long and you're like, oh God, that, that's sort of nothing. And then you hand it in and they give you a load of feedback and you're like, oh God, right, rework it. And you go home again. I think that's the lonely bit when you're like, it's just me with my brain to make this better. So I always thought that was an odd term, loneliness. But I think that the, the hardest thing I found about doing a PhD is the self-discipline to just battle with your brain to get stuff written. And I think that's the hardest battle you do. So the fact you might find it hard is completely fine because nothing that I've come across since doing it is as hard as, as, as that feeling. So just a few kind of, um, I, I've put helpful tips, that's massively of ambitious, but let's um, just say some, some thoughts from the PhD. Firstly, learn how you work best to know the pattern of, of, of your work. 
Uh, try and be part of a group or research network. It doesn't need to be formal, but I honestly think the reason that I got my PhD done in, in the sort of three years was because there were four of us, and the, the, the two who applied for the funding as well, and there were four of us who worked together. And it's a bit intimidating, and occasionally it'd be a bit gutting because they would just sort of be you know, going really quickly ahead of me. But I do think the sense that we were discussing stuff made me feel like I was connected, so that might be useful to you. Um, share your research really early on, I'll come back to this in a minute, but it is well worth, um, there's university postgraduate forums, there's, um, we have in, in the theatre film and TV department a postgraduate symposium, share your work early on. Um, I guarantee, it, well it is terrifying, but you will be loads better than you expect, and I'll come back to that because I think some of the standard at some conferences is pretty low. Um, so share it, get used to sharing it, get used to kind of going, I've done this, I've been looking at that for six months, I can now find 20 minutes of useful and interesting stuff to talk about. The sooner you get that as a discipline going, the better, because then you can get out to conferences. Okay. And finally, um, tell your supervisor what they are reading and what you want feedback on. I got into the habit of saying to my supervisor, Mary, I said, uh, Mary, this is, um, this is something that I've worked on several times, it's quite polished, and I want to know whether the argument hangs together over the you know, 30 pages, 10,000 words, whatever, or saying, this is something I would just like some general discussion about. It's kind of a bit of a kind of splurge on the page, because then you will get more useful feedback. And occasionally, um, Mary would be like underlining particular words, and I'm like, oh no, I didn't mean it to be polished, it was just something I wanted to discuss. So that might be useful, it helps you get some useful feedback. Um, okay, I'll go on to sort of the other end of the PhD, which is kind of the getting a job end of things. And we're just going to talk about not really my experience, a bit about my experience, but more, I've been on quite a lot of recruitment panels for lectureships in our department, so I've read lots of applications. So I thought I'd just give a few sort of notes about this. And um, I think you had a slide earlier about stats for um, academic jobs when they're yes. advertised, and they are terrifying. Um, and it is an unbelievably competitive um, market at the moment. However, so we had a theatre lectureship we advertised last year, and I think we had 70 or 80 applications. But very, very, very quickly, that's reduced to about 15, uh, almost immediately that is reduced to 15, because there's things that people just don't do. People are kind of fairly speculative. People who haven't even started a master's yet kind of go, I'm thinking about this, and you're like, okay, that, there's no, we don't need to read the application in any detail. So those figures are bad, and it is competitive, but it's not quite, it's not like there's 80 brilliantly qualified people for every job. In actual fact, when you get really down to it, the people who qualify for the job, um, there's the, quite a small number. So, um, when you're writing a, a cover letter, that has to really sell yourself and has to say why you're right for the particular place that you want to work. We get so many that are just generic cover letters and that isn't very useful to us. We want to know why you are right for us. <clears throat> The CV, somebody told me they thought, oh, I've had some applications and one person told me that they thought um, a CV should just be one page of A4. That isn't true in academia. Like most things in academia, they go on for pages and pages. You don't read everything. We don't need to know your GCSEs uh, and things you did at school. But don't undersell yourself. Do tell us the stuff that you've done, particularly like stuff that you've taught. Um, if you've done, if you've organised symposia, if, though, you just say that sort of stuff. Actually sell yourself in a CV. We need to see a potential for publication. We don't necessarily need to see publications. Um, generally speaking, the last appointment we did, um, most people who were shortlisted had one or two things on their CV. But if you've got an article that's in press and you've had conversations with a publisher about a book, and that can just be conversations, and I have those conversations with publishers quite a lot, and I had them quite early on in my career, towards the end of the PhD, if you email for me, it'd be somebody like Palgrave or Matthew in and say, this is what I'm interested in, they might say, right, write it up, that sounds interesting. Then you can put your CV, I've had conversations with Palgrave about the possibility of turning my PhD into a monograph. This is the person I'm in contact with and I'm currently writing up a full proposal. That's not a lie and that, that might be the difference between getting an interview and not because you've obviously thinking about the next stage of your research, but you don't need to have a book in the bag by the time you apply for jobs. That isn't, certainly in my field, that's not where we're at. Um, 
in interview, I just thought, I've added this just now, in interview they asked me quite a lot about what service role, so academic citizenship service role, I'd be interested in taking on. So really think about that. I, um, it, you, and you can learn quite a lot about an institution by just seeing who's on the staff and finding out what the big things they're doing are. So it may well be you can say, well, I'm particularly interested in helping run your postgraduate symposiums or... Um, for me, I said I'm really interested in admissions because I'm interested in outreach and making sure that we get the best students, not the most privileged students, the department. That was kind of, and it still is something that I'm passionate about. So I said that, um, and you know, they're always looking for people who take on those kind of fairly labour-intensive um, academic citizenship roles. So have a think about that. Those are the kind of things. When we interview people, we really are seeing people in those three different categories: the research, the teaching, uh, and the and the citizenship as well. Uh, with the, um, the ULTA programme, I didn't know this, but um, a colleague who completed his PhD a couple of years, oh no, a year ago in, in theatre, film and television, emailed to say he's really stuck because lots of the places he's applying to actually need you to have done some form of like formal accreditation. Now that, that was quite a surprise to me, and I, it's certainly not the case here. Uh, and exactly as Helga yeah, says, then we would say you should do that if you haven't already done some sort of formal accreditation. But I, that is one reason among many that I would recommend that kind of programme. And I'd probably think about doing it in your second year of your PhD. Don't, I wouldn't say do it immediately. If you're on the programme, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But it allows you to get going with the PhD and then start thinking a bit more about teaching. Right, I'm just going to go briefly talking through the three areas of, of teaching, research and service. And just some sort of thoughts I had about the stage that you're at. Um, go to conferences, definitely go to them. I I'm exactly in the situation that you mentioned, Helga, so there's a sort of theatre and performance research association, that's one of the big national ones, goes to different universities each year. I always make sure I go to that and now I've started to run one of the working groups within that. And then there were kind of very precise ones, so my PhD on documentary theatre, there was um, performing real people, um, documentary theatre and film, those sort of conferences I went to as well. Go to those. My very first paper, and I gave this in the first year of my PhD, was based on my master's research, and it was on a form of documentary theatre called verbatim theatre, where you only use the words of real people. And in the room was the professor who came up with that term in the 80s, and I was just completely terrified, and he was lovely. He turned out to be my external examiner on my PhD, and the article that I had in press by the time I applied for my job, he commissioned it. You know, he was, he was doing a special edition. Now, that, again, it's, it's kind of luck, but it's also like, well, at least I got out there and did that. Um, so go. And as I said earlier, the standard is much, much worse than you think. I don't know if you've been to academic conferences. The standard, I, 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 it sounds horrible, but it is pretty poor. So a few tips on this. Um, practice to get the timing right so you've got a 20-minute paper if you say you've got a 20-minute paper. I write them out and I literally rehearse them. I just, you know, sit in my office and I read it out and make sure it's 20 minutes. That immediately puts you in the top 50% of papers in an academic conference. Um, don't copy and paste from your, your thesis, because how you speak is not how you write. So make the sentences shorter, remove all the subclauses, make it a bit more chatty and accessible, because that, that will go far. That will put you, I think, in about the top 10. So do those things. The amount of conferences I go to where somebody just reads out, like literally reads kind of from their book, and you think, this is so boring. One, I could read the book. Two, it's not a paper. And three, you've run out of time and you haven't got to the main point of the... So, to do that, to go, and it is terrifying. I remember the feeling very vividly. I remember my supervisor, she was lovely, and she texted me just for it, and she's like, you know, good luck. And I remember exactly where I was when I got the text. I remember how terrifying it was. It's a group about this size. It was in Reading. Um, and it was completely terrifying. And then afterwards, I thought, oh, I think I can do that again. That will be all right. It went well enough. No one was horrible in questions. I've only maybe once or twice had like, not particularly nice questions. And even then, that's more about that person than it is about me. So put yourself out there. That, I think that's probably the most important thing to do, because you'll meet all the people who you'll then you know, work with through your career. Um, yeah, that's worth saying. The, 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 group, the, the network you're part of will be absolutely tiny. So for me, I've gone from, say, 20 or 30 academics who were kind of looking at documentary theatre, and now I've gone to maybe 50 or 60 academics who are looking at performance on um, television. So you've got to make sure you know those people. It's good if they've heard your work, and it's good if you kind of get on reasonably well with them. But it's a small group of people, so get yourself into that group. They're normally very, very welcoming. 
I did a book review during my, um, my PhD. Um, it's quite nice. My supervisor just said, I don't have time to do this. Um, Tom, do you want to do this? I reviewed on the book on something I don't know much about, but it's quite a nice way just to get something on a CV underneath the publications. Um, <coughs> that was for a journal. Um, REF is always in the minds of people who um, will interview you, um, so you just need to reassure them that you are going to publish stuff. That's the bottom line that we need to do. Um, impact is something that I find uh, is, uh, like a, a kind of slightly odd concept. That I kind of think it's part of what I do, and yet I feel it's in opposition with one of the main criteria of the thing that I'm doing, which is to write a scholarly standard monograph as being like the gold standard within my field for what I do. And yet that seems to me to be uniquely the thing that is least kind of impactful because the language we use to make it scholarly seems to run in the face of impact. That's a really negative view of impact, but I try and make sure whenever I do any publication that I do, um, I talk to non-academic audiences about it. So the book that's about to come out, I'm doing an interview in London on Friday with an actor for um, students who are training to be actors and um, industry people. And that, I suppose, the impact is not really an impact case study. I'm nowhere near an impact case study for my department yet. I don't really know exactly what they are. So um, talk to the people about impact. I clearly haven't quite got the hang of it yet. Um, uh, teaching. The good thing on CV is that quantity is not specified. It's just that you've done it. And that's really cynical. But try and get a bit of experience in different forms of teaching, even if you don't have the chance to run a full module. I mean, you probably won't have a chance to run a full module. But if you can have a look ahead to what's coming up next year and have a chat to somebody and say, could I do kind of one lecture on this? Now, if somebody said that to me, I'd be like, absolutely, yes, you can. That's delightful. <laughs> it gives me one less lecture, one fewer lecture to prepare. So that might be something you could do. Um, but try and make sure you've got a bit of experience. But we, on the CV, you don't normally say, I've got... 300 hours teaching. You say, I have taught seminars on this range of things. We're always teaching on stuff that we don't know anything about. That is just the day-to-day rea day reality of, of my job. I just have to be one page ahead of the students, make, sometimes just a sentence ahead to make sure I... But I mean, that, that is the nature of it. We are specialists in our research and we're generalists in our teaching. I think that is a, a truth of this, this um, sector. Uh, it's a great point about the feedback scores. If you can get those, that is worth doing. Um, and the sort of informal feedback that, that you mentioned is a really good idea. I had a colleague who did that brilliantly. Um, I think it was the one lecture that they did, and they just asked the students one thing that you're still confused by and one thing that you found useful. And they were then had all these, I mean, it was quite useful for them. So, like, okay, that wasn't clear, I'll use that again. And you can definitely frame that like, look, this is quite new to me, this is an area of expertise, but I'd like to know how you feel about what I'm saying. And it gives you then a list of whatever, 50 or 100 things that they found helpful, which you can then quote. And, and the stats are quite useful as well. Um, and you can ask the person you're um, working on a module with whether you could add a question about um, your sessions. That's what we often get. There's two, I don't know if it's the same in every department, we have two questions at the end of each module feedback form, which is kind of adaptable for the module. So quite often we say like, um, Tom took you for these practical sessions, please could you comment on these? And that's really helpful for that person. So you could ask for that. Um, to talk about service, so the roles that I've done since I started in 2010, I was the um, graduate, um, uh, the GTA coordinator, then I was admissions tutor, having promised it in the job interview, so they were like, you're not getting out of that one. Then my colleague went on um, research leave for term and I became acting head of theatre and programme director of the BA. And then he came back and I said, could we share the role? And he was like, mm, yep, yeah, okay. So we shared it. And then it wasn't exactly a coup, but then I kind of took over um, being head of theatre. And I've just finished being head of theatre. I was head of theatre for two years. So yeah, just Sorry, finished. It, no, but it's some like unspecified role in the department, which is like <laughs> akin to deputy head of department stroke assistant head of department. But I don't know what it is yet. So that, that, that makes it sound more interesting than where I am at the moment. Still got to talk to the new head of department about that. Um, so I took on loads of different roles um, uh, through, my, uh, through the last seven years. But before I finished my PhD, the roles that I did, which might be useful, were I organised a conference. Um, it was just a really small thing. And I, just, I think I applied with, an, with a lecturer for some pump priming. And we got, say, two grand. And that was enough to cater for a dozen people and to bring a couple of interesting people up from um, down south to talk about things. 
and that was just sort of a day thing I did. I worked on open days, which was quite nice because I felt like I was able to be a bit of an ambassador for the degree course. And I think my colleagues who saw me talking about it were like, oh, right, he's like okay at talking to potential students. That felt like a really good thing to do. I ran extracurricular sessions. So um, some of the actors I spoke to in my PhD, I said, do you want to come and do a session for the students? My department really was receptive to that. And then I did it. And that was nice because the students loved it because the actors were sort of TV or theatre actors that they'd heard of, so I could do that, and that's quite a nice, I suppose, profile thing for me at the time. Um, I, I think the biggest thing you can do is to, to sort of demonstrate your willingness to do stuff. And in, I can, I'm pretty sure, tell the difference in a CV between people who do stuff and people who are like, I'm here to do my research and, and, and go. And that those aren't the people that we want in a department like mine and I don't think it's a, true of any arts and humanities department so get involved in stuff um, absolutely balance it with your with your research that has to be the priority but but you can do both so I'll ju just very quickly finish with what my job's like now so I love the combination of teaching and research I think that is I, I just I do completely love my job I think it's a, a, a an amazingly sort of privileged position to be in where you can teach something that I absolutely love and I think if I didn't have the job, I'd probably spend most of my time talking about theatre to people who didn't want to listen. So at least these people have shown a willingness to, to hear about it. And then um, I love it that when the term's over, I go and do some research. I, I like the kind of the, the pattern of that. Um, I manage to do about half a day's research a week during term time. Sometimes none, quite often none. I, don't, we ha I have technically a research day, but everything spills into that day, prep and everything else. But I'm quite pleased if I have half a day a week during term and then out of term time I do manage to get some research done and I get most of my research done in the summer. So the second that the students go I'm like right now I've got to run at it and I, that's when I do most of my writing. Um, I've got more involved in management so um, as head of theatre I manage a team of 10 people that, that is sort of chaotic and f yeah, fun and quite challenging because suddenly the modules that I was teaching became the last thing that I was thinking about and the first thing was do we have staff to teach all these different modules if that staff member goes off um, on sick who's going to cover them that person's not happy how to work with them so it became me thinking much more about um, leadership of a team rather than students and that was an odd kind of a balance to strike I still have imposter syndrome with research I don't think you ever lose that I still think most of the stuff that I write, I just think either this is the most obvious thing ever or who's going to be interested in this when I finish. But the one thing, the one um, sort of strength I suppose I have with that is that I know I felt that before and stuff did get published and that, and that is a big thing which I know is a difference at your stage, you probably don't have that feeling. But do, like, do keep plugging away at it and the fact that you probably feel anxious about it is something that just goes right through your career, hasn't, certainly hasn't left me yet. I had a big post-PhD panic, as I said, when I published the only stuff that I knew about and had to think of something new, and I had no supervisor to send drafts to. That was a really weird feeling, although everything is peer-reviewed to within an inch of its life, so everything gets read several times by people. But actually handing in something that I thought was finished and sending it to a journal or to a publisher still feels very odd to me. Um, I have a high degree of autonomy over my modules and my time, but I'm always teaching things that I don't know anything about but I can kind of skew the stuff I don't know into something I'm more interested in and that again is something you probably get when you're in post rather than at this stage where you're like that's the lesson plan, deliver that, so I, you know, I don't have any of that although if somebody's taught it before and has a lesson plan that's ideal for me. <laughs> um, there's loads and loads of um, faff around teaching, loads of committees and I can't believe the amount of time I seem to spend not teaching and not researching but thank goodness we've got this word service which means that like it's got a term for all the other stuff that um, we do uh, and finally the uh, working with students I think is absolutely extraordinary I completely love it um, I still feel it's odd when people kind of go oh it's great I've got a year sabbatical and I'm not doing any teaching because I I really find that's the thing that invigorates me the most is working with students so um, and whatever sort of management stuff I, I go on to do or projects that I might go on to lead um, never ever want to lose that because I think that is kind of the lifeblood of what this, this job is.